<clears throat> Good to see everybody. If you don't mind, I'm going to turn like this. So uh, this is kind of the center now. Okay. There isn't a camera that I need to be facing, right? Or is it? Okay, they'll get my side view. They'll see my gut a little bit. All right, that's okay. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. We've already read the, the, heard the uh, passage read to us. And um, gosh, if I can find it myself. Here we go. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much for having me back. You know, I looked back to see when was I here last, and it was in April of 2021, so it's been, you know, almost a year and a half, but I'm really glad to be back. I'm so honored that um, Pastor Autry has invited me to, to, to take up his spot for this morning, and wherever he is, wherever you are, Pastor Autry, I hope you're getting refreshed and recuperated and that you'll come back just energized and ready to go again and uh, your family as well. And, you know, whoever is listening online, those who are right here, I, I want to just say to you, you are in the right place at the right time. Yes. You are. You know, as, uh, you know, driving through the storm this morning, and I'm sure maybe there's still a storm going on outside, you wouldn't know it being in here because, you know, I was looking up at the ceiling and I remembered something a youth pastor once said to me as he took us into the main sanctuary he said, look at the rafters in the building here. And, you know, I don't know if this is true or not, but he said to us, isn't it interesting? You go into almost any church, and the inside of the church looks like an upside-down hull of a boat. And he, rem he used it as an object lesson to remind me, see, this is the church represents the shelter that God gives us in the storm. It, it harkens back to Noah in the ark and how while there's all kinds of terrible things going on outside in Christ, he has covered us. He has delivered us. He has saved us. And, um, you know, thank, thank the Lord for that. <clears throat> now you'll never look at this building the same again. <laughs> so, you know, if you remember... And it shouldn't be hard to remember, when COVID broke out in 2020, you know, I, I remember driving down the expressway in, towards downtown Chicago. I live in Maywood. It's only 11 miles from downtown Chicago, but it normally takes me anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes to get downtown. And it's just because of Chicago traffic. And I remember in the middle of the day, I drove from my house from my driveway to downtown Chicago in 11 minutes. And you just do the math, and that means I was driving more than 60 miles an hour, right? And that included the side streets I had to get to to get to the highway, you know, and it was just like a ghost town. And it was during that time that this passage actually came to me. I came across this passage as we were reading through the, the Bible, our family was, and one of the things that I remember thinking, the, the upside of coronavirus was we get to spend a whole lot more time together as a family. And, you know, even pastors, I, I know it's hard to believe, we don't really get to spend that much time with our families. We're always working, you know, or out or in the office. And uh, we're always longing ourselves to be with family, our children, our wife. And, but I remember being locked up in the house like I know all of you were, and still... I felt alone because it seemed like everybody, I'd go to my laptop, busy on my laptop, my wife would be over there in the kitchen on her phone, my kids would be in the living room on their iPad or their phone or their television, you know, everybody was doing their own thing. We were all in the same space and yet I was feeling as alone as ever. And then the passage today came to me. And it revealed Jesus afresh. I mean, it's God's word. And, you know, the purpose of God's word, we're told from Genesis all the way to Revelation, is to reveal someone. To show us Jesus. To point to Jesus. And that's exactly what happened. Reminding me that, you know, I'm not alone. Reminding me 
that Jesus is God with us. And with that, let's pray, and we'll go into his word, okay? Father, we surrender ourselves to you now. Just as we have braved the weather and we have surrendered ourselves to be here with the family of God, to worship you and to hear your word and to be uh, provoked, inspired, to be challenged, to be um, comforted and soothed, but even to be convicted. Lord, would you honor your word so that as it comes to us, as you deliver your word to us today, it would accomplish its mission. It would not return to you void. Lord, Lord, do with us whatever you please. We acknowledge your presence here where two or more are gathered, and we also acknowledge the authority of your word. And so we study it together. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So let me read that passage again. And it was in verse 38, chapter 1 of the book, the Gospel of Mark. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else. And forgive me, I'm using a different version than what you have here. I'm guessing this is the ESV. I'm coming out of the NIV. Um, I only choose the NIV, not because I think it's a superior translation or anything like that. It's just, from what I understand, it's still statistically the most commonly used translation in evangelical churches. So that's why I use it, because it's kind of like... You know, it's when you walk, you know, at my church, we have a bunch of mics. I remember when I first uh, joined the church, you know, it's like you meet all these people and and you don't know, you can't remember their names. I'm really bad with names anyway. And then um, I remember thinking, you know what? If I don't know who somebody's name is, I'm just going to guess Mike. (laughs) And I found that I was right a lot of times by just (laughs) guessing Mike. So um, anyway. Uh, So Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and uh, driving out demons. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. And in reading this record of Jesus' encounter, one of his earlier, earliest um, miracles, this encounter with a leper, I am reminded of at least a few things. And I've already mentioned one of them. And one is that the Bible tells us, even back in Isaiah, that the one who is coming is going to be called Emmanuel. God with us. That he's not going to be a God far away, holding us at arm's length, but he's going to be with us. And what a comforting thought when, when, you know, you could ask almost anybody on the street, you know, what are some things you think of, like characteristics or character traits of God? And, you know, probably in the top Two or three, they're going to say, yeah, I've, I've heard he's holy. I'm not sure what that means, but i heard he's holy. We, we know that God is holy. And one of the things that certainly means is that he is so unlike us. He is not going to be found with any sin, right? He's pure, perfect. And what a comfort it is that a God who hates sin would say, I am God with you. I'm not going to keep you in the other room. I'm not going to ask you to keep your distance. But I'm going to be with you. I'm going to draw near to you. Secondly, I'm reminded that Jesus is God in the flesh. And, you know, we, you know the theologians call that the incarnation, right? Jesus has become flesh. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14 of chapter 1 verse of John, he says, um, the first, or first chapter of John, he says, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. You see, Jesus, who is God from the beginning, who is with God from the beginning, took on flesh, and he dwelt among us. You know what that means? 
even though we could say his home address is his throne in heaven, that he changed his address, making our address his address, making our neighborhood his neighborhood. He dwelt among us. You know, the word that is actually used there, you know, could be translated, he tabernacled with us. In other words, he pitched his tent next to us. Man, he is God with us, and he has taken on flesh. And that tells us that, you know, he's not a God who is unfamiliar, who, who's just kind of guessing. What is it like to be my creation? What is it like to be a man or a woman? What's, what's it like to be a human being on this earth? He doesn't have to wonder or guess or theorize. He experienced it. He has sympathy for us and empathy for us because he knows what it's like to be us. Jesus, the word from the beginning, the word who was with God and who, who is God, took on flesh. And he made his dwelling with us. But in this text, what else do we observe about Jesus and how he has come to his broken creation? Before we go right to verse 38, now let's look at the context, okay? So just a few verses back, starting in verse 33 and 34, it says, The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many and had and many who had various diseases, who also, he also drove out many demons, we're told. So what do we see about Jesus is that he is at a place where he has a successful ministry going on. You could say, like, the things that he's here to do, he is getting it done. So much so that people are crowding around the door. People are gathering around him. You know, I don't know about you, but most pastors... Most guys in ministry, if there's a crowd of people clamoring around them, they're not going to quickly say, like, you know what, I'm going to go see if there's greener grass on the other side. They're going to eat it all up, and and they're going to say, this is the reason. Look, there's fruit here. I am effective here. I'm going to stay here. But Jesus, in verse 38, in the midst of this successful ministry, says, Let's go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so that I can preach there also. That is why I've come. In other words, Jesus is saying, yes, there are people being delivered, they are being healed, demons are being cast out, but you know what? There are more places where there are needy people, people who need help, people who need to hear that the kingdom has come. People who need to hear that Messiah has come. People who need to meet me. And so in the midst of success, he says, let's go. Let's go to another town, nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That's why I've come. And it was then that this man with leprosy came to him. While he's preaching, while he's driving out demons, while he's having... This successful ministry, he is approached by a leper. See, leprosy is this disease which is mentioned in the Bible. I mean, we don't hear, we don't see the word leprosy 83 times, but we hear references of it because, you know, today, you know, when you look up leprosy, it, it, it talks about a specific disease. But back then, it was a class of diseases, class of conditions. And most often it showed up on the skin, and it could be like boils and blisters. It could be like oozing, um, you know, cuts. You know, if you, get, if you get a cut and it's infected and it gets all red and discolored, leprosy. Dry skin patches, leprosy. And you know what this tells me about leprosy? It's not just the leper who had leprosy. Everybody had it. It was a condition that everybody had. I mean, I can't prove this in, in the Bible, but I, I make, it makes me wonder, like, I wonder if dandruff would have been considered leprosy. Is that why so many of the men wore hats? 
And how many people would have had some kind of sore on their body and working really hard to make sure nobody saw it so that they could be out in public, so they could go to the market, so that they could go to synagogue. And they would hide their leprosy. But here is this man, a leper, and we know he must have had no success in hiding his leprosy. He's one of those guys who because the law of Moses had already been separated from his community, leprosy had alienated him, had cast him out, and at that time, here's Jesus involved in ministry. And it doesn't say Jesus approached him. In this case, the man was so desperate, he approached Jesus. And you know, and if, this, and if Jesus had seen the leper coming, and certainly he knows I mean, it would have been completely okay. In fact, everyone would have expected, Jesus, you need to back up. You need to avoid this guy. Don't get anywhere near him. The law of Moses tells us he's unclean. In fact, it's his responsibility to tell any bystanders, I'm coming and I'm unclean. Clear the way. Don't come any closer. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he boldly approaches Jesus And Jesus doesn't back away. You know, it's mentioned all these times. We think references to it 83 times. And you got to wonder, why is it mentioned so much? Leprosy was so concerning to the community, as I said, lepers are forced to live outside. They couldn't be among the population They had the responsibility of self-quarantining, warning unsuspecting people, crying out, I'm unclean. I'm unclean. And I wonder, is it mentioned so often because there is such a perfect illustration of sin and leprosy? You know, if you have leprosy, It was generally considered back in that day, it's an uncurable disease. You can't recover from it. If you are diagnosed with leprosy, it's probably a life sentence. And it's probably going to kill you. A life sentence, a death sentence, alienation, separation, rejection, people fearing you wanting nothing to do with you, people dreading to be contam- that you might contaminate them. So instead of warning Jesus to stay away, this leper approaches Jesus, and he says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Man, that's faith, right? I mean, there's no question here about does he believe Jesus can do it? He knows Jesus can do it. I don't know how he knows that. Maybe he heard the news. That town he's coming from, I've heard about the miracles that Jesus performed, casting out demons. I haven't heard about him curing any lepers, but he's healing all kinds of diseases. So he, why couldn't he heal me of leprosy too? I don't think he was concerned at all whether Jesus had the ability to do it. He was just wondering, Would Jesus be willing to do it? Does Jesus want to do it? So he says, he doesn't say, if you can, make me clean. No, he says, if you're willing, right? And friends, I want you to remember something. I mean, this is so simple, but it is so essential in our faith walk with Jesus. I mean, we we can probably list what are the things Jesus can do. What are the things God can do? And we would say, nothing is impossible for God, right? He can do it all. But what good would it be if God could do it all? He could save us, but he didn't want to. What if he could deliver us, you know, we're drowning, 
And all he had to do is, you know, he's got life, lifeguard training, so he could jump in the water and pull us out. Of, but he says, you know what? I like it up here. I'm getting a suntan. I'm not, I, I don't want to get wet. I just put a new pair of swim trunks on. I don't want to jump in the water. What if he was, was not willing? But what we're told here is not, we already know Jesus is able, but Jesus says, I am willing. In other words, I do want to. I want to make you clean. We have a Savior that isn't begrudgingly saving people like, ah, oh man, another one? That loser? How many times? No. He wants to save us. He wants to heal. He wants to deliver. Came to Jesus and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean, filled with compassion. Wow, there's another one right there. Because he's a God who has come in the flesh, he knows what it's, what it's like to walk in our shoes. He is filled with compassion. He's filled with compassion. He's not a God who says, you know what, the day's work is over, so now I'm going to commute back to heaven, take a really hot shower to get the filth of this sinful world off of me, and then commutes back in. No, he lives here. He's experiencing it with us every day. He knows our pains and our sorrows. He sees it every day. He doesn't live in a gated community with a security guard at the gate, and then he comes out among the people at eight in the morning and then goes back at five. No, he is living with us. He is so close to us. That is the Savior. That is the God. That is the Lord we serve. That is the Lord who invites us to believe in him and live. That's right. I mean, do you all remember, how did God create the heavens and the earth? He spoke, right? He spoke. You know, I remember in Sunday school I had a teacher who, as he's telling us the creation story, I mean, he, he didn't say it, but he motioned like he was picking up a ball of mud or dust or snow or something, making a snowball, and he said, and God created the heavens and the earth, you know, as if like he was doing something. At the time, I thought, like, wow, what a cool way to explain it or to show it. But we know God didn't need to hurl anything into space. He just spoke it, and it happened, right? Jesus, from a distance, could have said, I am willing to be clean. But isn't it interesting he didn't do that? He didn't have to do it, right? But he touched the man. Can you imagine the shock of people, his disciples, like, Jesus, what are you doing? Don't touch him. Oh, my gosh, I can't believe you touched him. And then maybe the, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees or religious leaders who might be, oh, you know, they're always kind of creeping around, looking over the shoulder to see what kind of things he's doing. They might go, oh, my gosh, what kind of Messiah is he? He doesn't even know this guy's a leper. He doesn't know the law of Moses, that he shouldn't go anywhere near him. The crowds who are like, oh, my gosh, what kind of person are we following He's unclean. But Jesus touches him. And can you imagine the shock of the leper? I don't I mean, we don't know. How long was he a leper? Who knows? However long it was. That's how long it's been since he's had human contact. If he has a family, I mean, how much he must long to, have, to just embrace his children, to hold his wife, maybe even to be able to go to synagogue and have the priest just pat him on the back and say, hey, it was really good to see you this Saturday. But none of that. And here's Jesus who touches him and makes him clean. And this is the God that we serve. This is the Savior that has been given to us as a gift in the Son of God. And it's a God who says, I'm not afraid to be near you. I don't need to Hold you out with a, you know, a six-foot pole, you know. 
he touched the leper and made him clean. He didn't need to worry about being contaminated. See, you know what happens? This is kind of the, the, the rule. This is what happens. A clean person touches an unclean person, and the clean person becomes unclean. Not so with Jesus. In Jesus' case, the clean person touches the unclean person, and the unclean person becomes clean. Because he's not just a man. right? He's the son of God, the savior of the world. Why is he on his way to another town? Because I have to preach there also. I have to preach the kingdom. I have to preach the good news. There are other people who are suffering, who need help. There are those who need to be healed. There are more demons that need to be cast out. There's another leper that needs to be healed too. You know, we, you know, today, I mean, gosh, it wasn't today. It was, uh, it was just two days ago. On Friday, I was at a Goodwill. That's actually where I shop the most, my favorite store. I was at Goodwill, and it was a pretty busy afternoon at Goodwill, and, and that there was a lady there. I know she was wearing a mask. And when I started coming down the aisle, she just did one of these and started walking the other direction, you know, like she wanted nothing to do with any other people. She was still trying to keep people at a distance. See, Jesus doesn't do that. You know, we have doctors who wear masks when they come see us. They wear gloves when they come see us, right? When, they, when we see them in their, in their, uh, in their room, in their <laughs> examining rooms. Uh, surgeons who put on, you know, like the hazmat suit to perform surgery on us. You know, some of it, and I would dare to say very little of it, has to do with their concern that they're going to contaminate the patient. Their concern is, yes, I'm, you know, I'm here to heal. I'm here to fix things. I don't want to get sick while I'm trying to help this person. I don't want to catch what he's got. I don't want that blood splashing on me. Right? That's why they get into the full garb. But not so with Jesus. He comes near. He comes near. You, so, you see, we, leprosy is such a perfect image of the sin problem. And when I say the sin problem, I'm not talking about something that you're all like, huh, what, what, what is he talking about? What's a sin problem? You see, we're all experts at the sin problem. We are all experienced with the sin problem. See, we, I wrong somebody, and then there's hurt, Right? There's violation, there's anger, sadness, disappointment, fear, all these things happen. And then alienation, we get separated because of sin. Somebody wrongs me, same thing. I want nothing to do with them. But you see, Jesus comes to address the sin problem. The Holy One of God comes because he's the only one who can fix the sin problem. He's the only one who has a solution. God has made a way for all those who've been separated from him who is holy to be able to draw near. And it's through his son, Jesus. And it's the only remedy. And that's why Jesus says, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That means no one, no one else can make the way. There is an uncrossable, unpassable, unbridgeable chasm between sinful men and holy God. We just cannot cross it. There's no way for us to access all the benefits of a relationship with God except through Jesus. God did give us another way, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. 
He gave us the law. And you know how that works, right? You only have to break one law, and you're a lawbreaker. You only have to lie once, and you're a liar, right? I mean, you don't have to be a, even a habitual liar. You're a liar. You only have to steal one time, and you're a thief. So you see, that's how the law works. And one violation separates you from God. So because that way is not a way to life, even the Apostle Paul tells us, right, you wanna, if you want to trust the law, well, then you're going to get what the law delivers, which is judgment and death. The law is going to remind you how much you've fallen short. It's not going to tell you how well you did. So believe in Jesus. That's the gospel. Are you afraid? Are you worried? Are you sorrowful? And Are you hurt? Maybe guilty and ashamed? Hurt and broken? You know, the way that the Lord called me to faith in him. I grew up in a Christian family, and for 20 years of my life, I thought I knew Jesus by going to church, reading the Bible, even praying. But it was at this moment of just utter desperate loneliness, knowing like all the, the wake. I was only 20 years old, and there was a sea of broken relationships behind me already. And then he reminded me, and then there's one that's even more important that's broken. You have a broken relationship with the God who has created you, your heavenly father. And boy, coming to grips with that left me utterly, desperately alone. Because that's what sin does. It alienates you. It separates you from other people, but more importantly, from God. So Jesus, who is God with us, he alone sent to restore a broken relationship. You know, usually, who is it that makes the reparations for a wrongdoing? The one who's been wronged? Or is it the one who does the wrong? The one who pays the penalty, the one who makes it right, is the one who did the wrong, right? If I stole something, then I gotta pay back and pay whatever penalty comes with it. But here's the situation. God did nothing wrong, and he's the one who makes the way. He's the one who pays the price with his own son. And he says to us, I have made a way for us to be together again. For us to have that intimate relationship that was always meant to be, even since the garden. Trust in my son, Jesus, and what he has done for you. If you're resting on anything else, like, Man, I'm better than that sister next to me, or I'm better than that guy over there. I'm sure better than that guy I read about in the news yesterday. At least I'm not a murderer, or I'm not an adulterer. But folks, we're all lepers. We're all sinners. And anytime we start comparing ourselves to somebody else, all we're doing is we're, we're just trying to find a heavier coat or a longer coat to cover up our leprosy, our sin. But we're not fooling anybody because God knows we're all lepers. We're all sinners. And anyone who says they're not is a liar. That's how the Bible says. So are you afraid? Are you worried? Are you feeling like you've been separated from God and from even other people? God's got a solution. Receive Jesus in faith. And then Transformation Church, 
Let me remind you, it's not just the people in this room who have leprosy. There are people just outside our front door that need to know there is a Savior. There is one who will make all things right between them and God. That there is no sin that they can't be forgiven for. There's no sin that is so deeply staining them that they can't be cleansed. Jesus can wash them. Jesus promises forgiveness, a new life, eternal life, and then all the benefits of a relationship with him. Because as you know, he doesn't just say, all right, now that you put your faith in me, all right, he kind of pats us on the back and says, all right, off with you. I'll see you at the end of the line. We'll meet in heaven. No, he promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm always with you, even till the end of the age. Because, you see, we're not just assignments. Like, Jesus doesn't say, like, okay, got that done, one more saved. No. He desires an intimate relationship with us. He wants to be near us. He wants to have fellowship with us. We're not just projects for him. We're not just an assignment fulfilled for him. We are his beloved. His beloved. So friends, don't you think the creator of all things can handle your problems? Do you think you have a sin that he can't handle? A disease that he can't handle? Can the creator creator handle, handle the problems that are outside in this world can he fix that too absolutely and does he want to absolutely absolutely and do you think the savior who has lavished his luxurious touch on a leper do you think he would withhold the presence of his holy spirit from us now that we've been saved, now that we have trusted him? Absolutely not. He's not going to with, withhold anything from us. His, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is promised to us. You know, this idea of the Spirit in us, dwelling in us. I mean, how much closer can God get to his people than to be in us? I mean, there is no closer, right? And there's such a world out there. I I hope Transformation Church becomes known as that is the place where no matter what your story is, they want you to come. Because they want me to come near to God. To experience the power of God's presence in my life. That's the church that reminds me God loves me. The unlovable, God loves. That God wants to draw near to those who've been cast out, those who've been rejected, those who have been forgotten. And Jesus wants to draw near to you and me so that we might draw near to the Father. Jesus is God with us. He is Emmanuel. And we're not alone. We're not alone. Let's go to Jesus in faith. Let's just bow our heads for a moment. And wherever you are right now, whether you're at home watching or maybe you're watching from a car or a coffee shop or you're right here in this room, it's not a conversation between you and me. It's a conversation between you and God. He's inviting you to draw near. Will you? Will you take a step towards him in faith? He will not reject you. He's not only able, but he 
is willing. He wants a relationship with you. Maybe all you need to say is, Jesus, I want it too. I want to know you. Just like you know me. I don't want to be far away anymore. I don't want to be alone anymore. I don't want to be separated and rejected anymore. Receive me. As I receive you in faith. Father God, thank you so much that you didn't stand idly by waiting for us to get our act together so that we could be presentable to you. That we might now have the confidence to dare to approach you. But Lord, just as we are with all of our spots and our wrinkles, all of our stains, all of our rebellion, our sin, our, all of our mistakes, all our flaws, you invite us to come just as we are and to believe in the remedy you have for our sin problem, our separation problem, our rejection, alienation problem, our disease that is a death sentence, a life sentence. Lord, thank you for inviting us. We believe your son Jesus. We trust him. We believe that not only can he save us, but he wants to. Lord, if you are willing, save me. Save me. And if you can't hear the Lord say it, let me say it. He is willing. Be clean. Be saved. Lord, thank you for your promise, the power of your word, the promise of your presence, the promise that sinners and enemies of God can now, because of faith in Jesus, have the right to be called children of God. We praise you. We give glory and honor to you. Help us to live in a manner that's worthy of you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.